Good evening and welcome to the Ombudsman's Office, Joint Office of Citizens Complaints. I'm Kimberly Connor, hosting this evening, along with Deborah Ferguson with the Ombudsman's Office. Also tonight as our special guest, we have Cherish Chrome Miller from Community Action Partnership. Before we get started this evening, I want to remind our audience that you may call in as the number appears on your screen throughout the broadcast. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, Cherish. Uh, so glad that you're with us tonight. Um, let's start with you describing what you do at Community Action Partnership. Sure. Uh, right now I serve as the president and CEO of Miami Valley Community Action Partnership. Um, I've been in that capacity for a little over a year now. My predecessor, Mr. Donnellan, was with the agency for 39 and a half years. So um, he retired and I was I was moved into that capacity. Okay, great. So talk to us a little bit about the mission of Community Action Partnership. It, it has a long history of servicing low-income families and individuals. It does. So. Um, our agency goes back to 1964. We were one of the first agencies started up by the Office of Economic Opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's as far back as, as our agency actually goes. Mm -hmm. And some of our first offices were over on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, and our mission um, really comes down to working in partnership with other community organizations like yours mm -hmm. um, to help people um, become more self-sufficient um, and that you know that language is a little difficult to understand sometimes but the idea is that we're trying to ensure that people can sustain or that um, they are able if possible to get off of any type of assistance whatever that might mean for them mm -hmm. and be able to sustain without any outside intervention okay. um, that's very interesting uh, d describe to us um, from a state and national level, the, the, the relationship of our local office, I know there's a national and a state level. Uh, talk right. to us a bit about that. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize, they think, oh, Community Action Partnership, that's just this local little thing. And years ago, we were called SCOPE. Some people still call us SCOPE. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but actually, in the state of Ohio, there are 44 community action agencies covering the 88 counties okay. here. And then across the country, we have um, close to 1,100 community action agencies across mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. And some of those are private nonprofits like mm -hmm. ours is. And a few are part of a government, usually a county entity. Um, so like in California, a lot of their community action partnerships are a part of their county government. Mm -hmm. And so we do have um, a national office, the National Office of Community Action Partnership in DC. Mm -hmm. And they help to advocate and legislate on our behalf because Community action agencies are the only entities that can receive monies from what's known as CSBG, that's the Community Services Block Grant. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't hear that one, they often hear CDBG, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Development Block Grant. Mm -hmm. But we're the Services Block Grant. And the Services Block Grant is meant to be very individualized for each area. So you take you know, our agency, um, so yes, we're here in Dayton, Ohio, we have what we consider our Montgomery County office, but we also have offices in Preble, Dark, and Greene counties. And the types of services that we might offer, let's say, in Preble County, mm -hmm. um, are catered towards the needs of, of a more rural county. Whereas here, being in Dayton, um, it's considered more of a metropolitan area, and so we make sure that our services are geared towards the needs in that community. What are the voids um, that are being left where because there's so many, you know, amazing agencies out there doing great work. Um, and the idea is to make sure that we're not missing any areas and that um, any of those voids are being filled. So we do have the national office um, that advocates on our behalf. Mm -hmm. We have a legislative uh, office called the National Community Action Foundation. Mm -hmm. and that foundation, again, helps legislate on behalf of not only our CSBG, but also where majority of like our funding comes from, which is known as LIHEAP, the mm -hmm. Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, lots of acronyms, <laughs> um, and HWAP, which is the Home Weatherization Assistance Program. So a lot of those monies come to us through Health and Human Services and Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. And so it's always important to be making sure that 
Um, we have people out there advocating, letting um, legislators know how many people are being served and what what good is this work you know doing and how do these dollars translate into helping not only these individuals but our communities as a whole very good so what would you say would be the primary causes when we talk about uh, poverty and and what has uh, has there been any any recent uh, changes in the in you know today when we talk about uh, uh, poverty in our community I think you know Poverty is one of those things where I think that years ago, if you, you stretch back into the Depression era, mm -hmm. you know, you think of people who didn't have enough food to eat, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. they were thin, they were emaciated, um, you know, their clothes were dirty, they lived in shacks. And so, yes, throughout the United States, you might still see some of that in rural areas. Mm -hmm. But I think that people have difficulty sort of understanding poverty as what it looks like in a metropolitan area, mm -hmm. because people often think, oh, well, you know, that person has a roof over their head, or um, maybe they're driving somebody's car, or they look put together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it could very well be that they have food shortage at the home, and they're using the food mm -hmm. bank or a food pantry to supplement. Um, it could be that the water is not on at home or the utilities may not be on mm -hmm. um, and they're still functioning mm -hmm. um, in that place um, using what means necessary to, to heat um, or stay cool. And so I think that um, poverty can look very different, you know, depending on what region you're in and where you're at. We don't often um, see a lot of people, especially as the weather gets cold mm -hmm, now, we mm -hmm. don't see a lot of people laying out on the street or things like that. Whereas if you go to some places in California, mm -hmm. my goodness, mm -hmm. there are mm -hmm. people everywhere because the weather is such, you know, they can sleep outside. Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to poverty, and, and I know I take a, a different view than some researchers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. analysts out there, um, I feel like poverty is always going to be a part of a society, especially a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that there are always going to be those that um, struggle to make ends meet mm -hmm. because especially now, um, minimum wage is not enough money to self-sustain. So even eight or nine dollars an hour at full, working full-time 40 hours a week is a not enough to be able to afford rent, utilities, food, transportation, everything that we need in our modern society. Telephone, right, everyone needs to have a cell phone now <laughs> and or internet access. And so um, I think that it's important to recognize that, you know, until, until our minimum wage really meets a, a self-sufficiency wage, which can be different based on where you live. The cost of living here in Dayton mm -hmm. is very different than the cost mm -hmm. of living, let's say, in Portland, mm -hmm. Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, what could be a self-sufficient wage here, let's say for a single individual with no dependents, roughly around $15 an hour mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, meet all the basic needs and not get any outside assistance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that that's, you know, one of those things where people are always, oh, well, we're gonna solve homelessness, we're gonna solve this. Um, no, I, I think that, um, you know, in a capitalist society, you're always going to have people that fall below that threshold. Mm -hmm. And I and I feel strongly that as a society in the United States of America, you know, one of the wealthiest nations, you know, in the world in 2018, that people shouldn't live below a certain standard. You know, we shouldn't let people go without running water mm -hmm. at this day and age, or we shouldn't let people go without electricity or gas. Um, you know, and so just determining sort of as a society, what is the baseline that we're minimally going to ensure that people can get, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, a certain amount of health insurance, right? We're not going to let that fall by the wayside. Social security, that we're not going to let, you know, those who are disabled or um, elderly and unable to work not have any form of income coming in. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's a long answer to a question about poverty, <laughs> no, but no, there's no, so much packed in it. That's you know? fine. That's yeah. fine. I just just to kind of capitalize a little bit more when we talk about the federal poverty level. You know, according to federal poverty levels, how many people in Dayton and Montgomery <laughs> County would you say uh, fall or are at below uh, the uh, federal poverty level co as compared to other counties that you service um, in the state? 
Yeah, so some of our other counties, they can run as, as low as 9% if you look at uh, DARC and Preble and some recent figures on that. Mm -hmm. um, Montgomery, um, depending on the demographic, we've got mm -hmm. children that are running roughly at 23%. So um, children are right now the highest demographic of those in poverty um, in Montgomery County. Um, and then otherwise you see the statistics running about 15%. But um, I, I always warn people about watching those, those statistics when it comes to the federal mm -hmm. poverty mm -hmm. level. So mm -hmm. the, the federal poverty level was set decades ago by a very well-meaning person who was trying to come up with some amount, right? And really what that amount was set on was what it would take a family of four to feed themselves. And the, the poverty, they've never re-examined it again to look at, okay, well now it's much more than what it just takes your family to feed itself. Um, it's not simply a, a matter of mm -hmm. that. It goes way beyond that. And so when we look at the federal poverty levels, um, those fall so far short of what you would actually need in order to function mm -hmm. in our society without some other type of outside assistance or help from another organization. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I always encourage people that they really need to talk with their legislators mm -hmm. and politicians about um, re-examining the federal poverty level because it's, it's at such a low level mm -hmm. at this point that, you know, now a lot of our programs, you know, for, so, for our community services block grant programs, a number of them you have to be at 125% of the poverty, le poverty level. Some of our fuel funds, it's 175%. Mm -hmm. And then for some of our weatherization programs, it's 200 to 300%. So it's starting to get a little silly when mm -hmm. you know, you're going above mm -hmm. these percentages. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's high time that as a society, we, we look at that number again. Absolutely. And that must make quite a difference between different areas, like the cost of living in Dayton versus San Francisco or some of the larger cities, I'm wondering how they account for that when they're el determining eligibility for programs. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's difficult, you know, for some of these national programs right. because you're trying to set a standard and, and yeah, it's very difficult to go back to them and say, hey, listen, this standard might be workable for, <laughs> you know, Ohio in a metropolitan area, but definitely is not workable for, you know, a Seattle mm -hmm. or someplace. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, allowing us to have that flexibility um, to meet the needs of the community more directly and look at statistically where people are at. Um, you know, sheltering in a place where it's below freezing temperatures, right, there's a lot mm -hmm. different shelter issues, housing issues compared to places where it's, you know, pretty cool temperatures throughout. Mm -hmm. Of course, you get into some of the desert areas and you've got serious situations with respect to heat, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially with elderly. So um, that's what's important about CSBG is it does give us that flexibility to try to um, mold each of our programs to fit, you know, our communities. Mm -hmm. But um, when you say 125% of the poverty <laughs> level across the country, mm. that is, it's a very different mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I, I was listening to you talk about there's so many needs. What is there, is there one specific uh, largest need that you uh, find locally that you're, you're encountering or the biggest roadblock when we talk about poverty? No, I, you know, it, it's different across the board. I can easily say that if we didn't have utility assistance okay. to be able to help with electric, gas, and, and then in our rural areas, bulk fuel. They do propane, oil, mm -hmm. things that. We would have some serious trouble. Um, we would have quite a number of people that, that really would be suffering. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, based on the sheer number, you know, the volume of customers we see, most of them are served in the utility assistance program. So it very much is a critical program. But when you stop and think about it, <laughs> Um, just because we're helping somebody, you know, um, either pay their utilities at an amount that's more comparable to what they earn or is at an amount that they can afford based on what's coming into the household, for a number of those households, income is not going to change. Mm -hmm. So that utility assistance mm -hmm. is always going to be needed mm -hmm. and it may not be possible to move that person beyond the help of needing utility assistance mm -hmm. um, because either because of disability, 
age, other circumstances of who they're a caregiver for, um, we, may, we may not be able to move them beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about, oh, you know, how are we moving people on to self-sufficiency, sometimes we are just through like utility assistance, mm -hmm. we're just helping people maintain, you know, and, and sometimes that in and of itself, you know, is a positive. Um, so I think it, it really depends on what you're looking at. Are you right. helping people maintain? And of course, <clears throat> our weatherization program goes hand in hand with utility assistance. So if somebody's receiving utility assistance, whether they're a homeowner or a renter, we refer them to weatherization. The idea then is that weatherization comes in and helps weatherize the home to improve energy efficiency and hopefully lower those utility costs, mm -hmm. right? So that whatever we are supplementing, that's being decreased. So. When you talk about some other programs, um, you know, I myself am an attorney, so I always talk about legal issues. It's one of those things I never shut up about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel strongly that we have a number of people in our society that are really held back by their criminal record. Um, mm -hmm. And we see a lot of people in this metropolitan area who are um, unable to drive because they're, um, they have a suspended driver's license. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, you deal with something like that. Now, there's a situation where the hope is, hey, if we can get um, somebody their driver's license back, then can we get them employed and get them to a point where, yes, they are bringing more income into the home and able to slowly maybe come off some type of assistance. Okay. So, wanted to just shift a little bit and, and uh, wanted to get your reaction to Oftentimes we hear people say we've lost the war on poverty or we'll always have the poor with us. I, I'm just interested in your reaction to statements of, of that nature. Yeah, I think that goes back to, you know, my thoughts on the fact that, yeah, the, the poor mm -hmm. will always be with you. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a society such as ours, and um, I think that you're always going to have individuals who cannot make, make ends meet. And you're always going to have a certain a portion of the population who you can do everything you want, but they may not want to be housed. They might have a mental health issue that is a challenge for them, and they um, maybe are having difficulty staying medicated. Um, it could be that they have addiction issues and they've tried to get help time and time again. Mm -hmm. um, there are just some people that they they want their certain level of freedom, and they don't want to be housed. You know. Um, and so I think that's one challenge always with homelessness. Um, you know, now the model very much is into permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are looking at some of those models and um, seeing, you know, what we can do as far as permanent supportive. So these are individuals who have experienced chronic homelessness and they do need some type of permanent support in place. So there's always, you know, a property or manager, a case manager on site who's sort of helping them with whatever issue has led them to con chronically be homeless. Um, so I think that's important, but you know, there again, until we change um, some of our laws with respect to um, minimum wage and um, health care, um, we are always going to have poor people among us because you know these are the areas where we see you know people suffering and or falling into poverty often mm -hmm. is because of of health related issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm curious to, to know that when we started off with the program, I introduced um, you as the Community, um, Community Action Partnership, but, and you mentioned about um, it was first scope and then it went to Community Action Partnership, and it, you have a new name. It's <laughs> the Miami Valley Community Action Partnership. Tell us about uh, what brought about the name change. Um, well, <laughs> I started working for the agency back in October of 2009. Um, and after doing, I was handling some legal work as it pertained to the, what was known as the Stimulus Act. Okay. And then after a couple of years, I became the Director of Resource Development. And I was very frustrated because Community Action Partnership of the Greater Dayton area did not fit into any boxes mm -hmm. of any grants anywhere. It was very long to say, it was long to spell out. And, you know, in some of our rural areas, at, you know, parts of Dark and Preble County, a lot of those people didn't feel like they were part of the greater Dayton area. Mm -hmm. um, they felt more part of, Miami Valley to them was, was a more suitable name. They could say that, yeah, I think we're still a part of the Miami mm -hmm. Valley. Um, and I think, you know, with some of our newscasts and things like that, you'll see where sort of this whole south, you know, west region of Ohio sometimes mm -hmm. gets encapsulated into Miami Valley. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, 
So it's a lot easier to put into grants, <laughs> and, uh, and it's a lot easier to abbreviate as MVCAP. And yeah. so, um, you know, but we're still doing all the same good work. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Okay, great. Well, with that being said, talk to us a bit about yeah, the Board of Trustees. How, how are they structured or how are they selected or, and or elected? Yeah, so that's what's very unique about community action agencies is they have this, what they call a very fancy tripartite board. And really it just means it's broken into thirds. So a third of our board has to be like elected government officials. So either an elected government official or an appointee, a representative by an elected government official. And then a third of our board can be from the private sector. So, you know, usually you want people from industry and private business, bankers, different things like that, um, um, who are really connected into the community. And then a third are low income individuals. Mm -hmm. And these individuals need to be democratically elected um, to be appointed to the board. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in Preble County, uh, we had our Metropolitan Housing uh, Authority um, get together in one of our Metropolitan Housing Units mm -hmm. and actually elected um, an individual there to sit on our board. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's also we can utilize other nonprofits that do our work that have a connection to a low income vigil that might be sitting on their board as well. So one of our recent appointments was from um, East End Community Services okay. um, came to us through there. Okay. And so um, it's very important um, to community action agencies that low income individuals be seated on the board and that they always have a voice and room at the table. So our agency also has advisory boards in each of the counties. Okay. And those advisory boards, they don't have a formal structure like our board, but um, it's made up of stakeholders throughout the community that can include, and we want to include, low income individuals who are talking about the needs of the community, what's going on, how do we partner with some other entities in there, um, and, and make sure that that information's being um, given back to the main board and that information that's happening at the main board is going back mm -hmm. to the advisory board in the local communities. Okay, I do believe we have a question. Okay. Um, so go ahead and ask your question. You're on the air. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this important program. Uh, I'm so glad that there is um, an agency in the Miami Valley trying to deal with the problem of poverty. I'm very concerned about it. And over the years, I have um, walked in soup kitchens and in a group called Circles Out of Poverty, but I don't feel like I've made much difference, really. And so my question is, are there opportunities in the Miami Valley to be involved in working for employment? for people, um, creating, joining together with others to create employment opportunities. That's my question. Okay, thank you for your question. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, you know, employment is one of those areas that's being tackled by quite a number of organizations. Um, where our organization focuses right now is we help people get transportation um, to and from work or job interviews. So we'll help with bus tokens or bus fares um, or fuel cards. Especially if somebody just gets mm -hmm. a job, you don't have the money to fuel up your car to get there before your two week check comes in. Um, and then our legal clinic is also helping with employment, dealing mm -hmm. with legal issues that are barriers to employment. You look at some of um, the other great you know, um, partners in the area that are focused heavily on employment. Obviously, Job and Family Services is um, a government entity in our community. And that's really where um, a lot of you know, their work is, is devoted to. And so that's one organization that I definitely say, you know, if you've got some time and you can be a mentor to somebody, um, that's a great opportunity there. And Goodwill Easter Sills also mm -hmm. has a lot of um, very strong employment programs as well. And I know they are always looking for volunteers and people that are willing to come in and work with individuals. Um, you know, we're living in a different society now, so computer skills is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. And so helping people, we have a computer literacy class and it's a very fundamental class, like how to turn on the computer, mm -hmm how to get you know, an email address, mm -hmm. how to send out a resume. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very basic. 
Um, and that helps individuals, you know, that are right in the beginning of that. We're, we're looking to maybe do a 200 level class to go a little bit beyond that to help individuals. But, um, you know, I know Sinclair is doing some employment work as well. And, uh, you know, there, there's great opportunities out there. And, and sometimes it is just that one-on-one -on -one assistance. So if you look at an organization like House of Bread, if you go and volunteer there, or just spend some time with people that are there for lunch and mm -hmm. ask them individually, you know, hey, wh what are you trying to work on? Or where are you trying to get to? And sometimes people just need a ride to places or they need a ride to clothes that work to maybe get an outfit mm -hmm. for a job interview. Um, so there's a number of different opportunities mm -hmm. out there and I think that people can find um, the right fit for them um, if they want to assist. Wonderful, wonderful. Lots of things going on. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just um, go back to the mission and, and the goals and things that you want to achieve or have achieved in your mission. When we talk about um, um, partners and community partners, um, can you talk to us or give us an example of maybe a, a, a current collaborative that um, you're engaged with that that's actively benefiting uh, members in our community? Well, one of our most recent ones is, um, it's actually sort of through Montgomery County, through the United Way, mm -hmm. um, and, and some of their collaborative efforts that um, they're doing. Um, we are able to get referrals from the Wesley Center to our legal clinic. Um, so people that are working with some of the individuals at the Wesley Center, well-connected, and so the Wesley provides those referrals over to us for the legal clinic because our legal clinic gets so many phone calls. I mean, so there's been at least twice now where we've had to essentially like close, close the rolls and say, you know, we're not accepting any other cases at this time because there is such a great need out there. Um, the benefit of working with a partner like Wesley is that they can provide some supplemental case management mm -hmm. to some of these individuals where, you know, we're just focused sort of on the legal aspect. They can focus on some of the other aspects of that individual's life. And so, um, you know, that's one of the great partnerships that we have going right now. Wonderful. That I think is mm -hmm. wonderful. And um, our microenterprise program, so, you know, unfortunately, uh, Wright State had to close its small business um, program. Mm -hmm. um, and so our agency um, picked that up. So Wonderful. Ascend, um, which is help funded by Fifth Thirds through their Community Reinvestment mm -hmm. Act. Um, so we are running that program not only here in Montgomery County, but we have a office in Greene County where people can go and get one-on-one -on -one support as to how their business is doing and get one-on-one -on -one counseling um, to help, you know, their business sort of thrive and get over, um, you know, any issues that they're having and keeping their business from thriving. So. Great. Well, with all of your, your missions and, and goals that you have, advocacy is, I'm sure, a large part of that and services. So I'm going to turn my portion over to Deb and let <laughs> okay. her ask you questions about <laughs> advocacy and services that the Miami Valley Community Action right. Partnership provides. Okay, well, thank you, Kimberly. Um, because, yeah, we're going to dig a little bit deeper now. Uh, you mentioned a lot of your programs and I think the audience uh, would like to know a little bit more about how to apply for some things. And so we're going to dig a little bit deeper. But I want to go back to what you, a couple things you've already mentioned is about advocacy and how critical it is. And there's a lot of social change going on in our community. But tell me uh, how, communi how Miami Valley Community Action Partnership, what are the different kinds of ways that you advocate for low-income people? I think that, you know, it's it's been difficult um, when it comes to advocacy. I think early on th that community action agencies did a great job of really being these like poverty warriors. And then politics and legislation mm -hmm. being what it is, mm -hmm. it really takes bipartisan support to approve and have a number of our grants and monies that are necessary to run our programs. And I think that for a long time, people were very scared about, you know, I need to watch what I say and do when I advocate on behalf of people because I don't want to upset one side or the other and, and lose the votes for funding of one of our programs. And, and I think that's sometimes the difficulty with some of these organizations mm -hmm. like ourselves that are um, rely heavily on government funding is that um, finding a way to be a voice for the low-income individuals in our community and still recognizing that that shouldn't matter whatever um, 
you know, whether you're a red or a blue, Democrat, Republican, mm -hmm. whatever, Absolutely. that, you know, everyone should care at some level about, you know, how we're treating uh, those among us that are, that are suffering. So um, some of the things that we're doing is, is making sure that some more of our staff is sitting on more of community boards. Okay. Um, so I myself Wonderful. am now on the HRC board and Wonderful. I sit on the board for the responsible banking. Okay. Um, and we're taking that Great. on as well Great. at the agency is um, we're going to be head, sort of helping head up um, the Dayton Community Reinvestment Coalition and making sure that we're charging forward and really recognizing what monies are going into our mm -hmm. community. Um, so sitting on more of our boards, as we look at our strategic plan, we are going to be doing at least um, a town hall forum in each one of our counties mm -hmm. uh, at least once a year. So at least once a year, we're going to give <laughs> people the opportunity to come. Yeah. Talk to us about what's going on. What are we missing? What would you like to be heard? Mm -hmm. um, and then um, some of that on myself is <clears throat> going out there and talking to politicians, talking to the stakeholders and saying, mm -hmm. these are some real issues, especially when it comes to some of these legal um, you know, uh, hurdles that our customers are facing and how those can be dealt with. Um, because, I mean, you're talking about that's that's something that's a societally ingrained. You know, it's been a long-running mm -hmm. history of, of of some of our difficulties, and so um, focusing on that, um, making sure that our advisory boards are getting out into some of these other community organizations and also talking with them. So at least asking one advisory member to go to some other meeting mm -hmm. um, or organization to um, take time and bring back to us. You know what's being said and what's well, what's going on there. So we're about to delve into a new needs assessment, and so the needs assessment is really to explore just what it says. What are the needs in each right. of our areas? So that will be done um, with a bunch of sort of surveys, these town hall forums, um, and you know bringing together community stakeholders and talking to them about you know what are they looking forward to doing, um, mm -hmm. so that we're not duplicating efforts you know um, we don't want to do that we want to work in partnership with each Absolutely. other and so um, that's crucial as well we we don't want to be fighting for some of the same pots of money how yes. can we best serve yes. the customer um, and make sure that we're still meeting this need and, and that's the important part so well because yeah I mean I'm realizing now after listening to you that community action is so much more than just helping individual people and all the things that go into making that happen. Um, so that, that takes us to a, a, an issue and, and is about funding because it is, there's so many needs in our community. And you mentioned the needs assessment. Different, tell us about how you, how you get funding. Who funds you? How do you go about, um, do you get private donations? Just tell us a little bit more about how you get the money to do all of the wonderful things that, that you're doing. Right. Um, so again, our organization gets a majority of its funds through Health and Human Services and the Department of Energy. And some of those dollars are, are set aside um, you know, by, by tax dollars and or monies that um, by legislation, some of our, our entities, our, our fuel entities have to give um, certain percentages back um, to the community. They okay. have to help support low-income individuals. And so those monies um, go into those dollars that go from the federal to the state. The state then has a fancy algorithm where mm -hmm. they determine um, the number of people, the percentage of poverty, um, and what's being spent out in those local communities. And then we are allocated those dollars. Um, and as much as possible, we always want to be ensuring that those dollars are going directly to benefiting the customers. So our, we keep our overhead and administrative costs okay. very low. And uh, by sometimes you have to by grant. I mean, some grants won't let you go more than eight or 10%. Um, 10% is usually the highest that you can have mm -hmm. um, go towards administrative costs, which is tough in this day and age <laughs> because you know, now when you think about copiers and scanners and all the computers and um, the internet, you know, we have to all have, and the servers and the back, a lot of that is like an overhead or an admin right. cost that before you didn't have when you had carbon paper right. and somebody, you know, writing something out. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that has changed, and it can be a challenge, um, but, you know, we do the best we can with respect to that. Um, so a majority of our funding is federal funded. 
Um, some of that is construed as state funding through some of our shelter mm -hmm. programs that we have. Um, we do get local United Way dollars as well. That's um, critical for us in Dark County. A lot of our funding comes from United Way. Um, we don't get a lot of individual or private donations. When we do, though, um, certainly grateful for them mm -hmm. because they're considered unencumbered mm -hmm. funds. So you take, for an example, you know, we have a woman that needs help getting out of a home she's been in for decades. And um, she needs to move into an apartment. And when we calculate her income, she's at 137% mm -hmm. of the poverty level. So she's just above our 125%. And there's nothing we can do. And so, you know, how do we come up with this 830 some dollars to help her? Well, when we have those private donations set aside, mm -hmm. um, those are the type of circumstances where both say, you know, this, this is a person, you know, who really needs mm -hmm. this assistance. Their condition, you know, at 90, year old, 90 years of age, her circumstances aren't gonna change. Um, and so um, it's a blessing when we do have some of those private donations, but, um, you know, it's, it's really making sure that the dollars in this community, you know, are being used going back out into the community, so. Okay. Well, it's, you mentioned earlier about weatherization and mm -hmm. how critical it is. And we are going into some cold weather. I think, <laughs> in fact, we yeah. may have some snow tonight, I hear. <laughs> um, can you tell us uh, a little bit about what kinds of things they do when they weatherize a home? Yeah, um, yeah it's a, one of those concepts when people say weatherization, like, what do you mean, you know? Right. Um, well, this year we got some really great models. So we did have some people that came to some of the local county fairs and we'll be having them next year at the county fairs. Mm -hmm. And um, we've offered to go around to some of the various commission meetings, things like that, and show our big models mm -hmm. oh, that good. show um, what our work does. So first somebody goes in and they do an energy audit. And so they go in and they take all these measurements to see where is air flowing out or coming into the home where it shouldn't? So when we think about you know cold weather and maybe you've got a door that's not fitting real right and mm -hmm. at the bottom, right, that cold air is blowing through the bottom. So that's an example of where we're looking at, oh, we're gonna see cold air coming through there. And so we do that energy audit. Um, we determine as well if the hot water tank is, is running the way it should if the HVAC system um, is running efficiently. And if not, um, for weatherization, the home can potentially qualify for a new HVAC system. Um, we've done everything from converting those old big gravity furnaces wow. to forced air wow. units, um, replacing hot water tanks. Um, some people, depending on their utility provider, can sometimes qualify for a new refrigerator, an mm -hmm. energy efficient refrigerator. Okay. Um, and so, after our contractors are done, um, then our team goes in and they actually make these little holes throughout the wall, throughout the home. And what they're doing is they're opening up, up that voided space between your wall and your exterior wall, and they are blowing cellulose insulation oh, in between there um, to give that layer of insulation. So it's essentially like wrapping your house in one of those styrofoam coolers or something, right? Yeah. And then they go up into the attic, they blow the right depth of um, insulation there as well. If there's a crawl space or a basement, they'll make sure that they're sealing up um, any uh, loose areas where air is coming in or out. And what we also do now is install fans. So uh, weatherization has evolved over time oh, and once okay. upon a time they would tighten up the house so much mm -hmm. that the house wasn't breathing. Well, now they install what's known as ashray fans, so they're bringing in um, good air from the outside and circulating that throughout the home to improve the air quality throughout the home. Wonderful. And so, and then at the end, an inspector comes back and does all those tests again, because mm -hmm. we have to show um, in our paperwork that we made the home more energy efficient. So they're testing all of that mm -hmm. in the beginning and at the end to show the difference in the energy efficiency over all of the home. And so that's, mm -hmm. a, yeah, a little bit about what we do in wow. weatherization. Wow. <laughs> that must Great. be really exciting for a homeowner whose bill, their veteran heating bill, yes. 
at least in the Dayton area, would be a lot less. Well, what a difference it would make. It does. Um, we get some amazing thank you letters from people, um, and that's really sometimes just the best thing that we're able to, mm -hmm. to share with everyone. And we do put those up on our Facebook page, so I encourage people, right. if, you, if you look there, we do, do share those letters of thanks, and, and we right. certainly appreciate them. Okay. You said also that people that come in for utility assistance then are referred to weatherization through that network. But how would someone apply for weatherization if that's what they were just interested in? Yeah, so if you're not getting your utility assistance, if you go to our, our website at miamivalleycap.org, uh, uh, you will be able to see the 800 number. You'll call an 800 number or our main number and go through the prompts to weatherization. Mm -hmm. They'll get your information uh, and they will mail you an application. If you're struggling in any way with the application, we ask you to call back and talk with that intake specialist, and that person will help walk you through the application okay. process. Mm -hmm. um, and so that application comes in, and we process it to see um, if you're income eligible for one of our programs, um, also based on what your utility providers are in your community, too, okay. can have an impact. Okay, good. Great. You also said earlier that the utility assistance is your... I would say largest volume program. So mm -hmm. here we are at the point, uh, we know a lot of people that are able to take advantage of us. Tell us that I think there's three different ways you can help with utilities, winter, summer, and PIP. Right. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we have a home energy assistance program. Um, overall, people can get assistance, but during crisis periods, so we have um, winter crisis, which is happening now from mm -hmm. November 1st to March 31st. Um, helping people with, um, especially when they have um, overages or large amounts back due, the amount that we're able to pay back towards that. We also currently have some fuel funds available that we can help mm -hmm. supplement with that. Um, for individuals that, um, so to get one of our crisis programs, you have to have a disconnect notice. Okay. Um, that's the important thing to know for, for those programs. What we really encourage is for people to stay on the PIP program. It's now known as PIP Plus, the Percentage of Income Payment Program Plus. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you want to be paying your amount on time every month. So we often tell people, you know, if you're using a bank account and you can get that amount, you know, deducted monthly at the same time every month, that's a great thing to do because when you recertify that that date is one particular date. Mm -hmm. But you also would have what's known as your anniversary date. And, and that's when you actually came on to receiving those utilities. And those are two different dates. And even if you just recertified, let's say you haven't paid on time and regularly and your anniversary date hits, you're going to be kicked off of that program. And then you're sort of back to square one. So you want to stay on the PIP program regularly and be making your payments okay. um, consistently. If your income has changed, we encourage you to make an appointment, come back to the office, and let us recalculate your income to change your payment amount. Now, we've changed uh, the way that you can get in to make an appointment. Okay. Um, one, we've made some increases in the number of appointments we're taking. We also have some evening hours available for okay. individuals oh. that are working. Oh, good. And we also have a program where you can go online to make an appointment. Okay. So if you go to our website at miamivalleycap.org, you go to utility assistance, there's a link there to the online scheduler, mm -hmm. and it'll show you what days are available. And then we also have a program that if you call in in the evenings, there are open appointments in the morning. Mm -hmm. So what we're getting away from is people standing in line yeah. to come to the agency. Um, it, we want it to be just like you're going to the dentist. If your appointment's 10 o'clock, we want you to come at 10. Don't think that if you come at 8, you're going to get in right. sooner. Okay. It's your appointment time is your appointment That's time. Good to know. So <laughs> please don't think, you know, oh, well, I'm going to rush and get in there, you know, right yeah. at 8 o'clock and I'll get seen sooner. Mm -hmm. No, we're trying to make sure that your appointment time is consistent across the board for all of our customers coming in. And then that way people aren't, you know, um, spending more of their time waiting than they need to, you know, in our that's office. Excellent. That's so, excellent. Yeah. What kinds of, of documentation do people need to bring in, and how do you handle individuals when they may be without income? Maybe they lost their job, uh, they had a spouse die, or something right. like that. How do you handle that? Well, the, the first comment I want to mention is that um, we don't decide what documentation we take, because okay. this is a federal program, okay. right? That's right they set the standards on what documentation we have to okay. take. So I think, you know, some people, it, it's very tiring. You know, it, 
it's very hard when your life is in crisis to be proving that you're poor. You know, that's difficult. And when you are constantly transitioning and trying to keep track of all these papers, it can be very, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's a tedious thing to do and it's aggravating. And um, we really empathize with individuals that's who right. feel frustrated by the amount of paperwork sometimes we have to go through. But in order to make sure that we keep our dollars on track um, and that um, we're, we're abiding by the law and regulations as we're supposed to, we do have to make sure that we have proof um, of citizenship for everyone. That's usually okay. a birth certificate. Mm -hmm. We need to have a social security card for everyone in the household. We need to have your your electric bill and your gas bill, your DPNL and usually veteran in this area bills uh, brought with you. Um, and then this income situation. Right. So usually we want to see the last 90 days of income. And often people can bring that if you have social security or something of that nature, um, bring that into us. If you have pay stubs, bring in those pay stubs to us or get a printout from your mm -hmm. HR of your recent printouts. If you're separated, you recently lost your job, right. ideally you want to get a letter of separation from the organization that you left. Um, and so, um, you know, something that says you're no longer employed by okay. them. Um, and so that documentation will be very helpful to showing that, um, you know, what you're going to qualify for and what documentation we need mm -hmm. to show that, okay, um, you are separated from employment now. Um, you know, so any of any documentation around that, um, so is important. Okay. Is there is there anywhere where a person that's applied can, is it on your website, can they go? on your website and, and look up kind of what they need to bring in so they're yes. better prepared? So we have a check sheet, uh, even a check sheet you can print out on our website okay. under that utility assistance. We've tried to make that very easy. Um, we also have drop off available at our office um, Tuesdays and Thursdays um, from nine to noon. People can come in, if you're just recertifying and mm -hmm. your income hasn't changed, nothing's changed, you can come and just drop that stuff wow. off. Okay. Our person sitting there will look through your documents, make sure everything looks good, and then we will get back to you so that you don't have to sit in the office and, and watch us sort of go through all of this paperwork. The state has changed um, the way that they're doing stuff, and the state is no longer accepting applications at the state level. So those will all be processed now at the local level. Okay, so I mean that would be the, the subsidy the HEAP subsidy is now processed at the local? Yes. Okay, yeah. So anyone level. that was recertifying by, if you send it into the state, they'll scan it in, but it's going to be processed at our office. So I just wanted to pause for a second. I think sure. we do have another call, and oh, okay. we just have a few moments left. Um, go ahead with your call, please. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my call. A very interesting program. I just wanted to ask if for the next upcoming couple of years, if you had a uh, short wish list if you, of, of what you might be able to do, if you could have, take a second to share that with us. I think a wish, wish list wish of list. programming, things you'd like to, to do if you had funding. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's, it's sort of um, trite to say, but, you know, uh, honestly, when people do those little fundraisers on Facebook right. where somebody just gives 3 or $5, mm -hmm. you know, to our organization, that really does add up. So instead of buying somebody a birthday card, you donate $3 to our agency. Right. Mm -hmm. Those help us in those circumstances where somebody is just over the income limit yeah. and, and we know we've worked with this person and we believe they're deserving of help. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our other nonprofits do some great collection drives and we work hand in hand mm -hmm. um, with them. Um, you know, our shelters in our rural communities, people do a great job of donating to our shelters mm -hmm. to help people when they're leaving our shelters and going out. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, sort of connecting with those, you know, in dark green um, and Preble counties, um, that's definitely helpful as well. But, um, you know, uh, to me, I'd love to be able to help those people that mm -hmm. are falling more but in that 125 to 200 mm -hmm. percent level mm -hmm. um, because those are still individuals who they're, they're in what we call that benefits cliff. Mm -hmm. So they don't make enough to self-sustain, right. but they make too much to qualify for any benefits. Correct. Correct. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's terribly difficult when you see that. And you want to be able to help people get out of that crisis situation. Okay. Okay. Well, just we've just got a few more minutes left. I, and I, I understand that your organization does provide housing counseling. Is that correct? 
We do. Can you tell us about that? Because I know we had a lot of foreclosures in the Dayton area recently, and I know that may be part of what you do. Can you just tell, uh, tell us something about that so we can make sure that all our viewers can get a good idea about that? Sure, yeah. Um, if you, you know, call to the agency or look on our website, you'll follow the prompts to housing counseling. Mm -hmm. A number of mortgage products now insist that you have what's known as pre-purchase counseling um, before they're going to qualify you for a mortgage. And our agency offers that um, either face-to-face -face or over the telephone. Um, and you get that certification saying that you've been through that hour-long seminar of pre-purchase counseling um, in hopes that you sort of really know what you're getting into with respect to this mortgage. Everything's, you know, um, clear to you with respect to your payments um, and uh, that you're headed on the right path. Um, unfortunately, we've seen a decrease in the number of mortgage entities that are doing some refinance mm -hmm. and reconfiguration of some of the loans. Um, certainly, if any of them are willing to work with you, our housing counselors are able to sort of help walk you that, through that process. Um, we are working with um, an IDA program to help people who want to save up for a down payment mm -hmm. for a home. Mm -hmm. And so um, I encourage people, you know, to, to reach out to our housing counselor and talk about if they would like to um, look into that program and potentially qualify for matching funds. So, you know, they put in a, upwards of a thousand, a bank is going to potentially match that so that they have a great down payment on a house. Okay. okay. Well, we've just got a few minutes left, and I, I want you to have the chance to, to share with the viewers anything about MVCAP that you'd like them to know. And tell us how people can find out more information. I, I, I know that you mentioned Facebook earlier. Yeah. And Twitter. Yes. How yeah. do people engage <laughs> on that? Can yeah. You? Yeah. So we're we're on Facebook under MVCAP. We're on Twitter, uh, MVCAP. We have an Instagram page. <laughs> Um, we have a YouTube page as well. In our YouTube page, we do some short videos of some of our programs. Um, of course, going to our website at MiamiValleyCap.org is always, you know, a, a great thing as well. We have an answering service program, so if you call our office, you are going to speak to a live person um, if you don't want to go through the prompts to get to which program you're interested in. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we definitely encourage people, you know, all of those things. Uh, of course, you know, I'm often wearing my Miami Valley cap uh, shirt uh -huh. out and about. People are welcome to always stop and chat with me. Um, what I'd like people to know is, um, one, we are helping with water bills uh, for people that are at 125% of the poverty level. We really want to help those individuals whose water has been shut off for some time. And if you're also at that poverty level and you have a repair issue, we do have a home repair program okay, um, that we're, we're utilizing for that. We also have dollars available in Miami County and the city of Kettering who have helped us with dollars for home repair as well. The other great program we're running right now is called Getting Ahead in a Just Getting By World. And uh, that program is a 12-week course where you sort of sit down and examine, you know, this is where my life is right now. Is this where I want it to go? What am I interested in changing about my life? What do I want different for my kids, my grandkids? And how can I set about doing that? Um, we have um, some great people running that mm -hmm. program, and so I encourage people um, to consider, um, you know, taking the time to sort of do that introspective as to, you know, what is keeping me in this cycle mm -hmm. of not being able to make ends meet, and how can I potentially change that? So, um, and then I think, you know, our legal clinic program mm -hmm. and helping people with mm -hmm. the license suspensions has been amazing. We've helped over 200 people get their licenses back. Wow, okay. So we not only help with their court fees and fines, but we help with their um, costs and we help them with one month of insurance as well. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. so if you got a main, main number, you can tell everybody who may not be connected to the Internet, what's yes. the main number they should call? 341-5000 is our main number. Mm -hmm. So again, that's 937-341-5000. Um, you can follow the prompts if you're interested in one of those mm -hmm. programs um, or speak with an operator um, and they can direct you to the right person okay. as well. And how about where you're located? Yeah, so here in Dayton, we're at 719 South Main Street. Um, we're right sort of tucked behind Carol Wirtz Goodyear Tire <laughs> and sort of stationed in between um, Goodwill and Daybreak. So right as that T comes down, we're right there in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, this has been wonderful. Yes, it uh, has. I learned so much about community action and uh, 
want to thank uh, everybody for tuning in and uh, feel free to contact Community Action Partnership at that 341-5000 number, right? Yeah. And uh, sign up for Facebook because I think Facebook and different mm -hmm. social media has been the way that a, a lot of you, a lot of people, especially our younger Yes. Our younger yeah. uh, audience. If it, we, we see something going on, we post updates there so we get the information out as fast as we can of stuff going right. on. Yeah. Yeah. So take advantage. Take advantage. Share what mm -hmm. you've learned tonight mm -hmm. with uh, family, friends, and others in the community that um, might benefit from what they do. They do so many wonderful things mm -hmm. and uh, are working for you and your community every day here in the Miami Valley. And thank you again for tuning in. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.